All right, so today we're looking at sport and deviance. The first thing that we need to do is really look at defining deviance from a sociological perspective. So you can see on the slide that I give you a definition about how deviance is an action, a trait, or an idea that falls outside a range of acceptance. But what's really important to notice and pay attention to is that really this definition is determined by people with the power to enforce norms. So we see that rules um, and enforcement of rules comes from those in power, the dominant social groups at the time. This definition also emphasizes three things. First, that norms are socially constructed through interaction with others. The second is deviance is socially constructed. And the third is people who are able to enforce the norms have the most influence in determining the limits of behavior. So again, those who have the power in society are typically the ones who draft the laws, enforce the laws, and change the laws. Just as an example, that's really not related to sports, but we see this with immigration laws designating um, which racial and ethnic groups are quote unquote appropriate to live in US society. Um, so we'll look now at how we see that present in sports. When we look at sports though, defining deviance is actually not easy. It's definitely not black and white. And part of that comes from the socially constructed nature of deviance. So there are four problems of deviance in sport that we're going to look at. First of all, there's no one theory that explains deviance in sport. And that's true in really with all social problems. We have multiple theories that look for explanations to figure out why people do what they do. So as a result with sport, we really need to look at the context in which it occurs. What's the social context? What are the motivations, the pressures driving people in their quest for sports performance? The second problem is that actions that are accepted in sports may be deviant in other aspects of life, while actions accepted in society may be considered deviant in sport. So what do we mean when we say that? So examples of that. Think about this for a second. Do you have any examples in your own experience? So one more recent example is the use of meldonium by Russian athletes. And one of the reasons here in America that we found out about this is because Maria Sharapova, who's a very famous athlete, was found to have taken the substance prior to it being banned. So it's a supplement that non-athletes can use, no problem. But sports associations have defined meldonium as a harmful substance. Some other examples not dealing with performance-enhancing drugs are missing practices or games. So we look at the motives of people in sports, especially athletes, as positive because their actions are directed toward the achievement of success. So the third issue when defining deviance in sport is we see that oftentimes deviance often involves an unquestioned acceptance of norms rather than a rejection of norms. So meaning that people buy in so much to what's going on in sports that they create a situation where deviance occurs. The biggest example of this is overdoing it deviance. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this um, in a few minutes, but it's going, um, going above and beyond, overdoing it, hence the name, to achieve a goal. So for example, football players are encouraged to get bigger and stronger so they can be better athletes. So they accept that norm, but many times they take it too far and use banned substances such as steroids to build um, muscle. So it's based on a desire to fit in, to achieve a goal, rather than to alienate others or reject norms. So there's an interesting quote, taking a drug to meet expectations in sport is very different from taking a drug to escape reality and expectations. So again, it's a different motivation. It's still defined a deviance, but it's based and grounded in a different motivation. The fourth problem is we really have difficulty developing norms to guide and evaluate athletes' actions because of science and technology. 
It's continuously evolving. We see that in everyday society. But it also evolves in sport. It impacts training and performance. They say that for every performance enhancing drug that can be detected, another one is being developed that can't be so easily detected. We also see this idea of cultural lag. And that's when we have technology advancing so rapidly that the morals and values and norms in society can't keep up. So one thing is the uh, example of Oscar Pistorius, and he was the athlete who had two artificial legs. There was a big debate over whether he should be allowed to compete in the Olympics because would these artificial limbs give him an unfair advantage over able-bodied athletes? And he was allowed to perform, or he was allowed to participate. He didn't have a high finish, but again, it raised this debate over how technology plays a role in sports. When we look at defining and studying deviance in sport, there are two approaches generally that people take. The first one is the absolutist approach, and the second one is a constructionist approach. So let's look first at the absolutist approach. Think of this approach as the more black and white approach in terms of what is right and what is wrong. We have rules, and when they're broken, deviance has occurred. The farther you go away from the ideal, the more serious the deviance. So it's almost like deviance is seen as being on a scale, and the farther away you move um, out from the middle, the greater the deviance. It doesn't really contribute to a sociological understanding of deviance in sports, but we see that this is the approach used most often by fans, media people, and the general public. This black and white, is it right or is it wrong? So the solution then under this approach is to get tough. Let's make punishments more severe. Let's throw out the bad apples. So it's based on the idea that people violate rules because they lack moral character and that normal people in normal situations are not deviant. So again, let's emphasize that, saying you're a rule breaker because you lack moral character to do what's right. But the weakness of this approach is it ignores the influence of powerful social processes in sports. So it leads people to label athletes as moral failures when in fact they are often hyper conformers. They're doing whatever it takes to live up to the label of being a successful athlete. So the constructionist approach takes the social context into account when they're looking at athletes and deviants. And sociologists use this approach, others as well, because this approach acknowledges that norms change over time. They change from situation to situation. So it is definitely possible, and this has happened in all of society, for something or someone to be considered deviant at one time and place and not at other times and places. So again, this is where our initial definition of deviance comes into play because we're looking at actions or ideas that fall outside a range of acceptance. So when the constructionist approach then looks at these two terms that you can see on your slide, deviant underconformity or deviant overconformity. So when we talk about deviant underconformity, this is an action or actions based on ignoring or rejecting norms. So think about this, um, skipping practice, failure to be there for the team, um, not working out in the off season. And this slide here uh, gives an overview of these two terms. So as another example, I've been a coach for probably about 20 years, and I've coached a little bit of basketball and soccer, but primarily softball and baseball. And I've just started coaching Little League again, so I have kids who are eight, nine, and 10. And let's just say the skill level needs some work. But we had a practice a week and a half ago where I arranged to have um, a pitching coach there, myself, our two other coaches, and then two high school boys who could help with some catching drills. So we had six coaches. Now we have 14 boys on this little league team. So you can imagine it's kind of difficult to um, corral all of them. So it was, it was a beautiful day. We get to the field, we're all ready to go. Four boys showed up. No idea where the rest of them were, but it was really frustrating and it really bothered me. One, because I'm super competitive, but two, because I'd put in all this effort to organize this 
supposedly awesome practice and no one showed. And so to me, that's an example of deviant underconformity. Yes, they're young, but hey, it was a beautiful day. They need practice and <laughs> they should have been at practice. So they're not doing the things needed to be a successful athlete and help the team be successful. So if those of you who have played sports or witnessed sports can probably relate to this when you know, kids aren't showing up or as you get older when athletes are skipping practice because they think they don't need it, but that actually impacts the team as a whole. On the flip side is deviant overconformity. And this is an action or actions based on uncritically accepting norms and being willing to follow them to extreme degrees. So there's often a failure to recognize any limits, such as playing with broken bones, using pain-killing drugs to stay in the game. Interestingly, this is praised in our society, deviant overconformity. It's used to elevate an athlete's status. It makes them seem invincible or more of a hero. So there was an example, I did some research with college softball and I looked at the 2009 Softball College World Series. And what really drew my interest was I noticed in the super, in the regionals and super regionals leading up to the College World Series, athletes were playing injured and those athletes who were injured were being praised by the announcers. Their actions were emphasized over and over again as being tough, being there for the team, sacrificing their bodies for the team. A Michigan player was playing with a broken leg. She could only bat, she couldn't run, but she was a power hitter. So they felt that having her in the lineup would help the team. And she said, when asked about her injury, I'm a fifth year senior, there's no way I'm sitting out. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna do whatever I can. And this was praised. Another player was playing with some foot injury and she was a pitcher, a first baseman, and she could also hit. And so when she got on base, she had to change her shoes because of her injury. And again, there was attention drawn to her about how amazing she was and how she was giving it all for the team. So we see that this leads really to overconformity. Now, so you may be saying, hey, what's the big deal? That's a big part of sports, giving your all. But as we're seeing with football, and you'll be looking at um, in our next section on violence in sports, people are beginning to realize, hey, this may not be the best approach. Also, embracing deviant overconformity leads to some other issues, specifically things that we're going to look at, such as playing through pain and athletes and eating disorders. But before we get there, let's take a moment and look at the sport ethic in sport and how that defines or how that is related to deviance. So you can see the definition of sport ethic. And the sport ethic really in a nutshell lays out what it takes to be defined and accepted as an athlete. So let's look at the components. There are four elements or components of the sport ethic. The first one is an athlete is dedicated to the game above all other things. So we see this exemplified in the media with different athletes, how they're dedicated to the game, they're there despite adversity, family situations, or whatnot. And you all can probably think of examples that relate to this. I still remember when I was 10, and as I said a few minutes ago, I'm highly competitive, and I've had to rein it in a little bit. But I also used to get really, really bad headaches, and I would throw up a lot and uh, have to sit in a dark room. They weren't technically migraines, but that's a whole other story. But with these headaches, they were pretty debilitating. And I remember getting one in the middle of a softball game, and I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to not play. So I left the dugout, went behind a tree, threw up, and then came back and went up to bat so that I could keep playing. So again, kind of a silly younger example, but it still illustrates that somewhere I, I have these values instilled that I'm dedicated to the game above all other things. The second aspect of the sport ethic is that an athlete strives for distinction. So you're trying to improve, to get as close to perfection as possible, if not achieve it itself. And losing sucks, <laughs> but it's tolerated because it increases the desire to win. I hate losing, and when I do lose, I think about what I can do the next time to win. Now, 
my examples are not that extreme, but there's an example of Justin Wadsworth, who was a top U.S. Nordic skier at the 2002 Olympics. He actually suffered internal bleeding because he was pushing his body so hard. And what did he say in response? Here's his quote. It's pretty special to push yourself that hard. End quote. Internal bleeding can kill you. <laughs> it's a sign that there's something wrong. And his response was, hey, I'm pushing myself that hard. I'm giving all that I have to, to this sport and to win. The third component of the sport ethic is that an athlete accepts risk and plays through the pain. We've talked a little bit about this briefly with the example of the College Softball World Series, but what we see is that these athletes embrace what's called this culture of risk, a willingness to compete in pain while subjecting one's body to danger on the field. And that's the mark of a true athlete, that if you're willing to give it all, to go out there and sacrifice yourself, sacrifice your body, then you are an athlete. You're a true athlete. And there's danger in this. Unfortunately, it's glorified in our society. We see that all the time. Um, athletes are praised for playing through pain, but it's debilitating to your body. It can lead to long-term consequences. Um, we'll finish talking about this in just a second because this also, the next one ties into it where an athlete accepts no obstacles in the pursuit of possibilities. So again, you're giving it all, you're not accepting obstacles, you're playing through pain, you're dedicated above all other things. All of these form the sport ethic. Sport ethic norms are widely accepted in cultures, like American culture. Here we emphasize dedication, improvement, sacrifices, pushing yourself. We teach that from a very early age, and we expect that if you are going to be an athlete, you'll conform to those norms. The constructionists also point out that people with power in sports carefully control sports deviant under conformity but they often ignore or encourage over conformity. So think about this in regard to the media. The media plays a very large role in glorifying over conforming athletes as role models. This is functional in some ways because it reaffirms these values that we're pushing, the dedication, the hard work, the achievement. So again, it's, it's reinforcing what's going on in society. And so here are some examples looking at how the media glorifies these overcoming athletes. So there's um, two, these first two links give like the top 10 or and the second one is the top 20 badass athletes who played through serious injuries. And in both of these links, um, they look at a soccer player. He was a goalie and towards the middle maybe of the game, maybe towards the end, I'm not sure which, um, he went out to make a defensive play and he collided with another player. And the game paused, but he refused to be taken out. He finished the game, they won, yay. Um, and then he went to get x-rays and the doctors found that he had broken two vertebrae and that one wrong move could have paralyzed him or killed him. So he was very fortunate, but he was also praised. I mean, again, he's in the top 20 badass athletes who played through serious injuries. So these types of stories, while we think, oh my gosh, it really reinforces this idea that, hey, this is what it takes to be an athlete and you know, damn the consequences. You know, I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm Michaela Minner, Milner, the player I said who played with a broken leg. I mean, she has the rest of her life in front of her. But that moment she saw as the most important moment. And that's a mindset that perhaps we really need to move away from somewhat. We see that some football players are moving away from that. There are many reported instances now of younger players who only play pro for um, two or three years and say, okay, um, we don't want to be injured. We're going to get out now. Um, and there's some mixed responses to that as well. So again, we see that fans also buy into this and glorify this and push this identity. We, as fans, like to see deviance as long as it reaffirms an acceptance of values. I mean, think of ice hockey. When the players fight, I mean, the rules in hockey are as long as the players are standing up, 
they can go at it. Once they get on the ice, the officials will come in and break it up. If you watch a clip of hockey fights, fans are excited, they're cheering, everyone's loving it. It's, a, it's violent behavior, it's deviant. You're sitting there punching someone or trying to punch them in the face, but it's part of this value in ice hockey. But fans also will condemn deviance when it's based on a perceived rejection of values. So Derek Rose and Carmelo Anthony are two NBA basketball players. Carmelo Anthony played through an injury and persevered. It was found out later that he had a very bad shoulder injury that he had minimized through the season. So he was hailed as a hero. Derrick Rose had to sit out for almost a year, and even though he was medically cleared, he did not feel ready to come back and play, and fans just ostracized him, said, why aren't you out there? You know, you're, you're good to go, right? At the same time, Lance Armstrong is a really interesting case because he was the man. I mean, he battled cancer, testicular cancer. He professed for years that he was drug-free. Um, he was doing it on his own through hard work and dedication to the sport. He was giving it his all. And so he was praised as this athletic hero. But then the truth came out that he had used performance-enhancing drugs. And, you know, he just dropped off the face of the earth, so to speak, because fans were very quick to say, wow, you know, we, we thought you had done it. You were following these values. You had... Um, worked hard, overcome adversity, you were a hero, but it turns out, no, you were doing it using performance-enhancing drugs. So that was seen as a rejection of values, and his actions were then condemned.